Okay, let's go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, uh, or perhaps listening to this recording. And welcome to the third um, in our Ammonia Energy Association series of Maritime Insight webinars. Today we have Amon, and we're very excited to hear from their CEO Andre Richholm and CEO Carl Arthur Brain. Uh, before we start, um, I'd like to point out that this meeting is being recorded. Um, we'll be on for about one hour and the recording will be publicly available. So first of all, the AEA, the Ammonia Energy Association, who are we? So the AEA is a global not-profit industry association that promotes the responsible use of ammonia in a sustainable energy economy. The AEA's mission encompasses both the decarbonization of ammonia for existing applications, as well as the adoption of low carbon ammonia in new applications, including direct use as a fuel for electric power generation or maritime transport, and indirect use as a hydrogen carrier um, and, and carbon-free energy commodity. With initial foundation rooted back in 2004, the AEA membership now includes more than 159 corporations around the world. We here as the maritime directorship of the AEA are working to bring the maritime industry into the low carbon ammonia fuel opportunity while also helping to empower the ammonia industry with an offering towards the maritime fuel sector. So what are these webinars about? So this is the third, as I say, in the Maritime Insight series. And we're handpicking uh, select initiatives from around the world, which illustrate how solutions are being found and progress made. And we're dedicated to raising levels of understanding and, and connecting stakeholders. And uh, while on the subject, by the way, our next webinar uh, during the second week of July will take us to the USA. We will hear about moves to integrate maritime ammonia fuel concepts um, within the existing um, ammonia transport networks on the Mississippi. So keep your eyes open for an announcement uh, and information on where to register for that. Um, on the AEA website, you'll find summaries of our webinars and, uh, as I mentioned, the recordings. So on to today, uh, Amon. So Amon uh, are located in Norway. And on their website, they announced the following. We are leading the green shift in shipping by pioneering the use of ammonia as fuel across ship new buildings, ship management, technology development, and bunkering infrastructure. So in the emerging space of alternative maritime fuels, this is a widespread of ambition. However, Amon embraces this broad scope precisely because it sees such intervention across the whole value chain as a key factor for successfully implementing ammonia as a maritime fuel. And I think we can, we can all relate very much to this. So Amon is a key member of multiple maritime ammonia initiatives. Amon is a partner in uh, Veritas bulk carriers. And uh, gentlemen, please correct me if I get any of this wrong, it's quite complex, uh, which in turn um, uh, established the Flex Bulk to NH3 Power Consortium. The Flex Bulk and H3 Power Consortium is closely related to a sister project, the Ammonia Fuel Bunkering Network. Amon is a partner in Azean Fuel Solutions together with eConnect Energy and is a partner in Ula Ship Management, which has been set up to satisfy demand for third party management of complex new vessels present and future. Yara is also a prominent partner in several of uh, Amon projects, and Yara is a household name known to many of you almost. So during this webinar, we'll learn about the journey that has led Amon to this point and how their small yet very efficient uh, team are tackling the challenges they face. Um, and uh, they have some special reflections to share regarding the import importance of effective collaboration and this coming together under a shared vision. So without further ado, uh, Andre, can I um, welcome you to give us a general presentation of Amon? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, and good morning. Uh, my name is André Rison. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Amon Maritime, uh, as you said. Uh, me and uh, Carl Arthur Brain are uh, 
chief commercial officer will uh, give you an intro and then I look forward to receiving your questions afterwards. So my part will be to give a general overview and introduction of Almond Maritime, uh, our group structure and projects, and then briefly mention uh, Viridsburg carriers. So if you go to the next slide. So you could say that our uh, our uh, business is uh, quite broad, but it's focused only on one thing, and that's pioneering ammonia as marine fuel. Now, since there are um, quite a few things uh, lacking in that uh, space, uh, being a pioneering endeavor, of course. Um, we need a kind of broad focus, but, but we look at our uh, way of working as being very focused and very concrete. Um, as a company, we don't have any existing fleet on the water needing uh, protection. So there is no innovators dilemma for building a carbon free fleet and uh, realizing our vision of building the world's first carbon free uh, shipping company. Uh, as part of that, uh, we have our own in-house development of uh, bunkering technology. That's a same fuel solutions and joint venture with Econnect Energy that uh, Carl Arthur will um, focus more on uh, afterwards. That's uh, the, the missing link that we saw uh, in the established ammonia industry where uh, you could see large scale production, uh, large scale bulk handling terminals for ammonia, uh, established shipping network, um, but no uh, port infrastructure and no terminals really made for, uh, for bunkering. And, and that's why we, uh, we started working directly on that as well, even though our basic vision was uh, to build a carbon free shipping company. Uh, we were uh, quite successful in um, being granted uh, government soft funding for our consortium projects, uh, where we have one that's going uh, in the direction of building a carbon free shipping uh, transportation network uh, for uh, short sea bulk uh, industrial clients, uh, which Viridis is uh, leading that group. And then uh, building the corresponding uh, ammonia bunkering network where ASEAN, the partners, Amon and, uh, and uh, E-Connect are, are leading that group um, with the partners such as Yara and uh, location partners such as Fjordbas and GOT and Mandal. So really the, the vision here is for this to be the early days of uh, carbonizing the international shipping industry. Um, the first ships and bunkering terminals that we build, uh, we, we look at them as the key to enable a full scale shift to carbon free fuel in international deep sea shipping. Uh, showing uh, by example that uh, uh, it's possible and it's possible to do it with uh, commercial uh, viability uh, before uh, any carbon tax is available. We clearly support the view that uh, in order to decarbonize uh, the entire shipping industry, uh, you need carbon taxes and so on, but, uh, but we believe that the world is in a hurry and we believe it's possible to do things before that. And, and that is where our strategy lies. Nesta. So our group structure, um, uh, follows this, uh, let's say, holistic view, but uh, focused uh, niche uh, segment um, strategy. So Almond Maritime is uh, the parent company. Uh, that's where we have our own employees, and that's where our uh, affili affiliated companies are built out of. Those are uh, for niche specific shipping segments like Viridis bulk carriers, which is our short sea bulk uh, in uh, Northern Europe um, approach. That's a joint venture with um, well-established um, fully integrated shipping group, Navigar Logistics or Navigar Group. They have 15 vessels on the water today in this segment, uh, as well as Mosfol's uh, Red Rie, which is um, the maritime investment arm of our 
main investor in Amman, uh, Glasta Holding. Then uh, Asane Fuel Solutions is uh, also a separate uh, company that's a 50-50 joint venture with Econic Energy, uh, which is a um, gas and fluid uh, technology and engineering company uh, here in, uh, in Oslo. And uh, we built this company together to uh, offer turnkey uh, bunkering terminals for ammonia. Then at last we have uh, Ula Ship Management, which is our uh, new Norwegian uh, joint venture with the uh, Banner Schulte Ship Management, BSM. 50-50 uh, as well, uh, building a um, fully, really a fully integrated approach in Amman uh, Maritime with in-house ship management. But also having the, the the quality and scale of um, partnering up with the worldwide uh, <coughs> ship management company such as BSM. That that means that uh, we can uh, we can approach ship management with a fully integrated approach with ship managers inside of our uh, offices while still enjoying the the scale and quality benefits from from being part of a larger group. Um, the management uh, team is uh, myself and uh, Carl Arter, along with uh, Stena Kostol, which is our CTO. Um, in our board, we have Andre Glasta and Jan Sigurig Musta from Glasta Holding, along with Mats Hovo Solm, who is the independent chairman from uh, Thomson. So, next one. So, just to say a little bit about the uh, Viridis Bull Carriers uh, project. Um, Specifically, uh, it has been in the making since late uh, 2020. Uh, it's a new joint venture in this space. Uh, we like to say it's uniquely positioned because uh, you have one partner with uh, uh, technology and uh, new building uh, expertise focused on ammonia, on maritime. You have one partner who is um, uh, has a long uh, history and uh, experience expertise in this space. Uh, short sea bulk uh, experts um, Navigare group uh, and then we have one um, say financially uh, quite strong partner in the group as well with a long uh, history from uh, from deep sea shipping uh, most wholesale so together those three partners are uh, are in a special uh, position in order to build a carbon free uh, shipping company for the short sea bulk market we have been uh, working together with leading technology suppliers, um, leading uh, client partners in this um, space. On the next slide, we'll go through uh, them. The project consortium uh, was awarded the pilot E, R&D and investment grant from Norwegian government in December 2021. Um, and that really gives uh, uh, a solid foundation for uh, developing uh, the solutions and technology and also uh, clear visibility on uh, investment grant afterwards. So I think we can go to the next slide. So what a flexible project really is, is uh, an effort to build an efficient uh, zero or uh, very low emission logistic network through a set of zero emission uh, contracts of freightment or uh, time charter agreements. Uh, the ammonia fuel here is, is chosen for its flex flexibility and tradability. Uh, the ships will have an um, endurance of um, 3000 plus uh, nautical miles, meaning any round trip voyage uh, in the map can, uh, can be done uh, on, on one bunkering. Um, we are planning ship orders in uh, the middle of 2023 with deliveries from 2025 and, and uh, onwards. And um, re really the key here, uh, along with, uh, of course, developing a new type of ship using a new fuel, uh, is to build an efficient logistics network, uh, handling cargoes from uh, the seven clients who are in the project and really catching the synergies between them, uh, limiting time and ballast uh, to uh, as little as possible and integrating the whole uh, logistics chain for uh, the transportation with the logistics chain for the fuel 
uh, in the ammonia fuel bunkering network uh, project. All in all, our uh, aim is that uh, this project becomes a green game changer for source sea bulk logistics, and our initial uh, five ships becomes uh, a large fee, uh, first for us, and then uh, many others going in the same direction. Okay. Um, yeah, my, uh, my name is Carl Arthur. Uh, I'm the Chief Commercial Officer in, uh, in uh, Almond Maritime. I uh, work on the commercial side in most of our uh, various segments that we're in, uh, involved in. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to, to Zane Fuel Solutions. Uh, as it says on the screen, uh, Zane Fuel Solutions is a pure play ammonia fuel technology company. Uh, so I'll go through what what that is and i'll also go through a little bit our green platform or green initiative as it says in english um and our ammonia fuel bunkering uh, bunkering network so uh as as Andre alluded to in his introduction um a zane fuel solution is is a joint venture between us and in armo you know we, we can say that we represent demand uh, and then you have eConnect Energy, uh, which uh, is really focused on delivering solutions for gas fluids, and they've been uh, been uh, working on that for the last uh, last ten years, predominantly in the LNG business, but also looking at other types of gases. So, as in fuel solutions, you know, from from the almond side, we saw um, there's a chicken and egg dilemma. Uh, you know, we can work as much as we can on on developing ships that will run on, on ammonia. Uh, however, we have a, 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 a risk that, that uh, you know, we have to wait and see and see who takes charge on, on the bunkering infrastructure. You know, ammonia is a great place to start because we have more than 130 ports around the world that have uh, ammonia infrastructure, either for large scale import or export. And we have, uh, have um, you know, an efficient logistic network with all the gas carriers, to, to, you know, carrying ammonia around the world today. The, the piece, the missing piece in the puzzle is, is, uh, is the last uh, infrastructure bit. So um, the core uh, business for is in fuel solution is to develop and sell turnkey bunkering terminals. They could either be onshore or they can be floating. Uh, in the, the offering from the company, we see you know, a definite need of doing feasibility studies. Um, you know, there's a lot of work goes around where do you place such a, such a terminal within a, a, a port due to the toxicity of, of a character of, uh, of ammonia. Uh, you have the engineering part, you have the operation part, and also doing work with, with our clients regarding supply chain and, and logistics. We decided to uh, create a consortium project uh, called Ammonia Fuel Bunkering Network that I will go through in detail, where we found uh, partners uh, that, uh, that we can work with that fill all the different, uh, different uh, requirements in the full ammonia network, uh, logistical network. So we've been working on uh, on on these since uh, since the fall of, of 2020. Uh, again, in close collaboration with the leading uh, technology suppliers and and clients, uh, we applied for um, the green uh, platform or the green initiative uh, funding scheme from the Norwegian government. Uh, we got that awarded back in uh, back in August which is partly uh, a support for the technology development, but also uh, an investment grant for the first pilot unit, which is what you see on the, on the screen there. Much of the foundation or the idea also behind a Zane Fuel Solution is that we need to make a cost efficient, scalable solution from day one. Um, you know, it's gonna be a tall order for any any port or bunker supply around the world because in the beginning you will need to support one ship the first ship that comes before the volume starts to grow so having having something which is flexible and scalable we believe is uh, is uh, is key 
Uh, as I said, there's a close collaboration with the whole uh, whole ammonia fuel uh, value chain, and we're really trying to to solve the the infamous chicken and the, and the egg dilemma. Um, in the consortium, we we have a great collaboration with uh, with Yara, and as we announced on the on the first of April, uh, Yara has has made a pre-order. Uh, of 15 bunkering terminals to uh, to focus on uh, initially on the on the Scandinavian market, uh, but Zane uh, is is in in a position to offer this technology or this solution on a worldwide uh, basis. The construction of the the first uh, unit or units will be um, the construction start will be in the second half in uh, in uh, 2023. As it says on the on the picture there, you know we are both working on the land-based solution and also on the on, on the barge solution. You know much of the technology. This is proprietary design and also uh, patent-pending solutions uh, to tackle some of the issues that we have with uh, with uh, uh, with that. We you know we're moving now from from the large-scale terminals where you have large volumes and less frequency to smaller volumes and high frequency. So there's a lot of work around uh, around uh, the safety aspects, both on the technical side and operational side, to make sure that it can be placed in any port around the world. As we said, we created the, the ammonia fuel bunkering network. Uh, it's uh, e-connected Almon um, that was was uh, taking the initiative to this. Uh, we have uh, Yara uh, with as a very very important partner. Uh, Sintev, which is uh, Northern Europe's largest independent research organization, DOT and uh, and fuel with passes to uh, to ports. Um, very important to have them involved in the project. Um, high egg safety is a gas disbursement uh, anal analysis company, and then we have Veridis and also the other ship segments we're working on in in Amon. And that represents the demand uh, that will decide the throughput and and the volumes on these uh, these terminals. As as Andre said, very very pleased we're getting the the public funding. Uh, we believe that uh, that the Norwegian government has really stepped up their game and is supporting these green initiatives uh, in in many different ways uh, to making the decarbonization of of, uh, of shipping uh, shipping happen. This is how we we have built up built up the 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 network. You know we have covering everything from uh, from uh, from safety and research uh, and from upstream up to to the end uh, end user. Uh, you know Yara, uh, which is uh, the world's second largest producer and largest uh, trader of ammonia in the world. Um, you know represents a really really important piece in the puzzle uh, as they have all the knowledge uh, they produce it they ship it they uh, they uh, they trade it uh, fuel boss and got uh, they are potential the first locations for uh, for the bunker terminals uh here safety they run all our analysis and and uh, and, uh, and uh, are really the experts in uh, in uh, in safety as in fuel solutions, which we're talking about, we read as normal ships cases. We think it is is a big, big, big advantage, both from uh, from developing the, on the ship side, and also from the developing the bunkering side to see this as one. As so we have some control of of the timeline on the two, so we don't risk that we have ships that is there but don't have bunkering, or we have bunkering there's no need for them, but because the vessels are not there yet. Uh, Sintef is also a very, very important partner on this. Uh, they have a, 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 call it the sister project that runs parallel to our project, um, where the, the objective is to de develop and disseminate knowledge contributing to the necessary technology advances. This is a project which is, is what we call a public knowledge building, uh, because we really recognize that we need to get the, the, the general public's acceptance when you're going to place this in, in ports and also trade ships in and out of, uh, out of uh, ports. As I said earlier, you know, we, we are really, really 
uh, enthusiastic about ammonia as fuel. Uh, you know, it's carbon free, which we think the future is going to be, and not carbon neutral. Um, there, we have a great start off point with regards to all the current infrastructure and, uh, and the logistics. Uh, there's already a large scale production. Uh, you know, production will turn green, not because of shipping, but because the fertilizer industry needs to decarbonize it by itself. As I said, there's uh, already large scale volume shipped on, uh, on the water today. Uh, and as shipping will decarbonize towards 2050, you know, this is a 30 year uh, decarbonization run we're, uh, we're getting ourselves into. And we believe that ammonia is the best carbon free, uh, free options. So, you know, the, the, the client, potential clients for, for the solutions is the same is, is, is the ports that will support potentially up towards 100,000 ships in the future that will run on, uh, on ammonia. So I think that concludes my, uh, my presentation and we're happy to, uh, to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you both. That was uh, fascinating and very informative. I can see we have quite a few questions clicking in in the Q&A function here. Um, I, I hope they, they can continue a little bit for a while. I would just like to, first of all, take a few questions uh, myself from, 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 our, from our own point of view. And I think that one of, one of the interesting things here um, is uh, Norway and other um, hotspots around the world where ammonia is moving forward quickly. Could you, could you help us out with understanding what are the, what are the vital ingredients in these hotspots? Do you think which which are coming forward, and what other areas of the world would you say are have a similar environment for progressing maritime ammonia fuel? Well, I think uh, in in the case of Norway, um, first of all, it's uh, it's a seafaring uh, nation. Uh, everything related to the maritime uh, world is, is really where uh, Norwegians have made their living uh, for um, a very long time. Uh, today, if you look at the three largest uh, export industries, it's, um, it's uh, offshore oil and gas, um, offshore oil and gas service, um, aquaculture, fisheries. So, so it's all related to the sea, and uh, uh, then, of course, uh, as an industry, uh, you would like to be on the forefront of something that you see coming. Um, if you see, look from the policy side, um, uh, you would like to, to push it in that direction as well, because you you know that uh, uh, that you're strong. And of course, Norway is a, it's a fairly uh, rich country. Uh, that means also that our cost level is uh, is high. So you, you can't uh, compete only on cost. Uh, you have to compete on uh, being uh, early with uh, technologies that you can uh, export and so on. So so I think it has a lot to do with uh, with the natural uh, positioning and, and where we are in the industry uh, today. Uh, and then of course uh, that that's looking at at it from a market. Point of view. Uh, the other side of it is that um, we we know that we need to decarbonize uh, the industry, and uh, uh, we think it's uh, the responsibility of uh, of all nations uh, in the world to to go early, but uh, but those that are um, let's say especially well placed for it, both uh, due to financial resources, but also a technologically advanced industry. Uh, they have the tools to, to run and um, we, we are very happy to see that Norway is doing that. Uh, and from our company's perspective, that's, uh, that's uh, what we are doing as well. Thank you. And, and I think an add-on question to that is, you know, um, this, this, is, this is an Ammonia Energy Association event and we're discussing ammonia. 
but very, very quickly, because this is a very long answer, potentially, why ammonia and why not some other alternative fuel? Either of you uh, want to jump in there? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a whole presentation in itself. And uh, as you say, we, we are in uh, a group of people who have uh, are either just uh, showing up randomly or, or are kind of interested in, in uh, ammonia as an energy carrier uh, itself. But in short, uh, our conviction on uh, ammonia as fuel is, uh, first of all, it's carbon free, not carbon neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that uh, let's say hi history will not be kind to the whole concept of carbon uh, neutrality when it comes to fuels. Uh, we we believe that uh, it, it will be totally apparent if it's not already that in order to to really decarbonize shipping, you have to uh, decarbonize the the, the fuel. Uh, no CO two from the thermal. Uh, will be uh, the way to decarbonize shipping. And then it's really a matter of uh, a few uh, available fuels. It's uh, ammonia, compressed and liquid, uh, hydrogen, LOHC, uh, and maybe some uh, fancy uh, metal hydrides and, and so on, but very few options really uh, when you look at carbon free. And within those, it's ammonia is well established in the world. It has um, the highest volumetric energy density, which is really what is important for displacement uh, vessels, such as all, all merchant vessels, that, uh, that's the key thing. And it's fairly easy to, uh, to store and handle. It's only minus uh, 33 uh, or a fairly low, uh, low pressure. Uh, <clears throat> one other thing is that it can be, um, it can be produced and transported in vast quantities <clears throat> with uh, quite low uh, marginal cost. Mm. So um, it, it's, it's fully scalable. If you <clears throat> do it from electrolysis, uh, then of course uh, you need water, air, and renewable energy. Um, and that's it. Uh, if uh, with, with gas uh, as a base, it's uh, it's uh, fairly uh, similar, uh, a bit more advanced of value chain with uh, with CCS, uh, which is needed, of course. Uh, but it's it's fully scalable. It's not uh, okay. We have to we have to burn down another uh, forest. So feedstock is a, is, is a pretty place. simple, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, that, that, that was a long answer, as, uh, as you said. Yeah, I, sorry, I did, I did I it to myself. To answer, no. <laughs> yeah, no, but I like what you say. Uh, history will not be kind to um, neutral fuels. That's that's you heard it first here. That's a very interesting kind of in a nutshell statement. Um, and uh, moving then, I mean, just going back to your maritime side. Uh, you, you you were saying, you know, Norway's a maritime nation, etc. But you've also done something interesting, I think, in that you have a quite a generic hull design for the Veritas, uh, the, the Veritas project. Could you just take us through, you know, why, why this generic hull design and how do you expect that to work? Because often ships are almost one-offs or just a series of ships. Well, yeah, in... Um... In general, first of all, the short sea bulk market in uh, in Europe is a fairly large market. It's uh, over three thousand vessels today. Um, very high uh, average uh, fleet age uh, in that group. So, so we have a kind of mixed group of uh, of technology and uh, hull designs and so on uh, all already. But uh, in itself, the, that type of vessel is very well suited uh, to be a highly flexible. Um, uh, vessel platform uh, really so if you make an efficient hull that can carry bulk uh, cargoes you can also uh, easily vary the, um, the cargo gear uh, on such a vessel and make it quite flexible to to do um, various related tasks so for example if, if you're um, transporting raw material uh, to a plant that's producing uh, fish meal for aquaculture. If you add a little system for um, uh, being able to uh, bring complete fish feed from the factory 
out until the fish farm as well and deliver it directly to, uh, to the storage facility there or directly to the fish, then, then you're adding uh, flexibility to the vessel and, and potentially also increasing the um, uh, commercial utilization because uh, you're bringing uh, one product into the uh, production facility and taking one out and, and moving up the commercial value, value chain of the underlying industry. So, uh, so, so it's uh, things like that that we would like to be flexible with on that vessel as well. Uh, not only in terms of uh, trading flexibility that we talk a lot about, uh, being able to offer uh, the same range as conventional vessels. We we believe that will be very important, and that the future does not lie in um, coming up with uh, uh, new uh, low emission, zero emission vessels, but with a significantly uh, lower um, endurance. Um, so that's, mm -hmm. when we're talking flexibility, it's, it's both of them. Flexibility for a lot of cargoes, doing a lot of uh, different services, uh, but also uh, having a good range. Mm. So you've identified with the technology risk, if you like, in, in, in a new fuel and new technology for the propulsion, you've identified kind of almost a way of offsetting that by identifying a kind of a generic hull that can be applied to various well-known segments in the industry. So it's a kind of a nice balancing act uh, and a way through the, the potential problems. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot of, that's a very interesting perspective uh, because there's, I think there's a lot of people very worried about the technology side and they haven't thought about these kind of solutions. Um, and um, we are going to going to for a moment to um, uh, the project itself, and and I think that there will be some, you know, this is a very dense network of partners in various parts, and you have a great deal of the value chain there. Um, so, kind of in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of roll the question into into both of these, and maybe Carl Arthur, you you'd like to um, respond on this one. Um, how how important were personal relationships uh, in people you already knew in the industry, etc., or people you could read out, reach out to easily and kind of make a network of interested parties? Um, and is there any is there anything missing? Do you think, or is there anything really important and anything missing in this kind of massive uh, bunch of of people put together for this value chain? Well, I think it's, you know, uh, personal relationship is always a good way to start when you're, you know, into this development journey, you can yeah, say. And you started during COVID times, right? Yeah, well, I mean, the, um, you know, uh, Almon was established uh, in the fall of 2019. Uh, I met Andre the first time uh, the day that Norway closed down due to COVID. Yeah. So much of the things that we have been able to to create and uh, and the, the consortium um, we have created, it's uh, it's all been through COVID. Um, I think you know one one thing that we've been been very focused on when we have been building the consortium is to to have you know companies with very clear roles into the consortiums that there is no misalignment. Everybody knows what they are responsible for and that we don't have anybody competing for the same position in a sense right mm. so we have very clear you know split between the various uh, various responsibilities and who brings what into the consortiums uh, you know is a one thing thing missing you can say one thing that we haven't haven't really you know we have engaged it but not through the consortium but we uh, in in Armon and and also certainly some of our partners is, is, is the financial communities, right? Uh, you know, uh, we hear a lot of talk about, uh, you know, the taxonomy and the uh, Poseidon principles and all these things and the banks are, are bragging about that they will be, be there to support, banks and financial institutions are there to support, you know, this green transition mm -hmm. uh, and that you will be able to get better margin. They will there to, to, to help fund it. And, and that comes, you know, uh, we're not there yet uh, in order to to uh, to order things, but that's going to be the next sort of step in our discussions. Is seeing are they really there to take technology risk mm. on their loans and investments? Mm. Historically, banks has been not the best at doing that. So um, you know, we have a lot of conversations with uh, with different parts of of the financial community, and that's 
you know, uh, when we come with with our projects, as you you know, we discussed with uh, with the Viridis, um, you know, we have have a very good client base. We have solid uh, technology partners. Uh, we're really tying all the loose ends together with having you know the infrastructure with the ship, and we're having uh, having a very important relationship with the main fuel supplier. So I think we're trying to to you know not come to to the market with with a lot of loose ends and a lot of risk we're trying yeah. to de-risk it not only for ourselves but also for our clients yeah. hence also for for the financial community that will will hopefully give us uh, give us support which which i think they will but uh, it's going to be interesting discussion when you get down to the the actual discussion and not yeah, only but, talking yeah and at the same at the same time let's face it we all don't want the banks to take risks with our money so i mean it's like <laughs> It's a, it's a two-sided coin here, but uh, exactly. this is a big challenge. Um, I think that it might be fair to, to switch over to some of the questions coming in in the question and answer from the audience here, um, of which there are plenty. Um, there was one question that caught my eye immediately, and it's a very practical question. Are you, if you're able to answer it or you want to answer it, are you looking at fuel cells or are you looking at com internal combustion engines? So the, the question was uh, fuel cells or internal combustion engines. Um, well, we have not uh, made a final uh, choice, uh, but uh, what, what we have seen um, since the start and uh, what we believe in still is, uh, is that the internal combustion engine is, uh, is still much more uh, mature than, uh, than fuel cells. Um, Especially, um, especially when it comes to large fuel cells, because fuel cells have, have been uh, used in uh, smaller applications and so on. Um, then fuel cells uh, for cars are quite established. Um, but then uh, going from ammonia to a cracker uh, in a pen fuel cell, you need a very, very high... Um, uh, cleanliness or uh, concentration of, of uh, pure hydrogen. So uh, the internal combustion engine um, has proven very resilient for uh, about 100 years now. Um, fuel cells um, have been advertised as the solution for about 40 years. Uh, but we have not seen that adoption uh, increasing by any uh, large uh, factor, and we 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 don't see it that uh, happening now either. Um, to be honest, we we have not made a final uh, choice uh, on exactly the engine maker or so, on, but we are fairly certain it will be uh, an engine uh, and uh, and not a fuel cell. But uh, if someone uh, comes to us with a large uh, scale fuel cell that actually works and actually has a, a sufficient lifetime and robustness, then of course we will change our mind. But uh, we, we have not seen that so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I think that, yeah, this sounds, sounds like a reflection from a lot of the industry. There's still, you know, there's work ongoing in both fuel cells and, and, and uh, the, I see, uh, internal combustion engines. So it's, uh, yeah, so. Can totally understand you're still at that that point but leading one way uh you know for obvious reasons um there was a question came up earlier uh and it's come up again and i think that we may we may as well address it quickly if we can there is there is now there is now coming on some pressure on ammonia for fertilizers and of course um this we hope is is perhaps a temporary situation but people are are wondering um, so with pressure coming on ammonia for fertilizers with uh, turbulence in the world, um, do you see any threat to the future of uh, ammonia as a fuel, especially green or low carbon ammonia uh, as a fuel? No, no, I didn't. Um, in, in short, uh, no. Uh, of course, the, the war is, uh, is terrible uh, and a lot of... Uh, raw material for or the feedstock for uh, fertilizers and the fertilizers themselves uh, come from Eastern Europe and uh, Russia and Ukraine in, uh, in particular. 
But uh, there are about 180 million tons of ammonia being produced a year, uh, about 250 million tons of installed capacity. Uh, and to what, where we are now is in the very, very early stages of really just starting this up. There, there are no vessels on the water today uh, that uses ammonia as, uh, as marine fuel. And uh, the vessel sizes that we are working on, for example, that's about 5,000 tons uh, of ammonia a year. So, I mean, we, we, we can uh, build 10 of those and uh, it's still only going to be at 50,000 in the market that produces 180 million uh, and can produce 250. So, so we don't see any uh, conflict there at all. We don't see that uh, shipping marine fuel needs are going to uh, starve uh, the world. Uh, like uh, we have heard some arguments that that's not going to happen uh, because the production, uh, yearly production is uh, way too large to be getting an impact like that. And then once, of course, shipping starts building a big demand, that's going to be very, very visible. Mm. Uh, and then you can increase the capacity to take that uh, because uh, a ship is built uh, one uh, at a time really and um, uh, and you will see the market growing and, and that will be very uh, very clear and um, and uh, ship usually has about two years construction time and um, the order books are available so we, so, we don't so, see yeah. that risk so you see a mutual growth of, of scaling of this and, and it doesn't necessarily, it's not all going to happen next year and be a huge competitive situation. It's going to be a growth indeed with the rest of industry, which is, uh, there's probably more of an issue with competition for the green electron, right? I mean, that's maybe more of a pertinent question rather than particularly fertilizer. Um, going back, and we can't avoid uh, safety and uh, environmental issues. And there are questions coming in. Um, uh, this is a very specific question. Uh, and I think it's very relevant. So, um, and the, to read it out, what would be countermeasure against ammonia leakage during bunkering? For example, water spray, if water spray, how to treat ammonia contaminated water, i.e. release it without anything or special care should be taken. This, I know, is something which is under development or anything, but do you have any initial reaction to that? You know, washings from um, uh, ammonia contaminated water, if you, if you look at it that way around, it's, it, it absorbs very quickly. But if the washings from that in a traditional situation with, with liquefied gases and things, we're not too bothered, but potentially um, ammonia um, uh, solutions are, are, are a potentially a bad maritime pollutant. Have you yeah. kind of got too far down that road yet? But maybe you have. No, uh, definitely. I mean, uh, leakage uh, safety, both uh, for ammonia as, uh, as a liquid or even uh, drain water uh, containing a high concentration of ammonia or, or releases of ammonia as a, as a gas. Um, those are very important to avoid. Uh, and it's, uh, it's part of our design uh, to avoid all of them. So, uh, so we are designing around having no uh, release of ammonia to uh, the environment around uh, during normal operations. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so no process uh, leaks, uh, no draining, uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, then you're looking at um, potential ammonia releases from an incident. Uh, and then, of course, we, we are rating the different uh, incidents and uh, we are making technical barriers um, uh, for uh, the ones that uh, uh, we should make technical barriers for, basically, uh, where the frequency and the consequences at such a level that uh, that, that needs to be done. Um, yeah, I, will, I will not uh, go exactly into detail about uh, how we do that. But uh, the, the short story is that um, for sure, uh, you should not release uh, any ammonia to uh, the environment around, just like you shouldn't release any diesel. And uh, we, we should be even more careful uh, to not do that than uh, what they are in the, the, let's say, conventional bunker industry today. Yeah, uh, fair enough. So, I mean, it's, you know, I guess, it's absolutely on the radar as an issue and it's being dealt with uh, operationally and technically so. Um, there was a question here. Um, 
this has come up again. So it's a question about capacities, bunker capacities in the ports. So um, you, I think you mentioned this, Yara interested in 15 bunkering stations dotted around. Um, how, how would you answer that? I mean, I guess the question is how big, how much volume will you, would you think you'd be storing at each port? Depends on uh, the size of the port and uh, how many vessels are uh, are going to be bunkering ammonia there. So uh, if you look at it from a different uh, perspective, you could just say, okay, um, uh, volumetric energy density of ammonia is uh, one third of uh, diesel. And uh, if you assume that uh, all vessels are going to uh, change to, to ammonia in the future, you just look at uh, the demand in, in each port, uh, assume it's going to be constant, and then you have your answer. Uh, then, of course, that's not exactly how the world works, but, but just as a, as a reference there, um, marine uh, bunkering market is about 650 million tons uh, of uh, various diesel blends uh, a year. And you can multiply that with uh, about uh, 2.3, and then you have ammonia in terms of, uh, in terms of weight. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be massive when it comes to our solutions now um, in the first uh, stage we we are uh, designing those not for uh, when this whole transition has happened we think it's going to take 30 40 years but just to serve a, a first demand so so what we have are um, uh, thousand to four thousand uh, cubic meter um, floating bunkering terminals very flexible in that you can take in this fairly small bunkering terminal to a port, serve the needs of that port up until a certain level, and then uh, move it somewhere else or include another uh, similar unit to, yeah. to take the increasing demand and, and um, avoid over investing in uh, in the early part. So, so, so I guess uh, that's uh, both the macro and micro um, uh, answer. Uh, and we think it's it's smart to start small, but start small in a flexible way. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I hope that answers the question for those those listening. It's come up a few times now. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I've had another technical question. We're getting close to time here, so we'll try and get through these quickly. Type C or type A tanks? So I think the question is about pressurized or refrigerated tanks. Um, I think you're you're looking at f I, just from the graphic you've shown. I think you're looking you're looking at fully refrigerated tanks for storing. Is that right? Uh, yes, but uh, but he is uh, right to to answer that uh, question as well because uh, it is a sea tank, but it's a refrigerated sea tank. So okay. um, so we are we are storing uh, ammonia in uh, cool uh, liquid state, which is the safest way to uh, to store it. Uh, but we uh, have flexibility to receive it uh, in, in other uh, phases and, and states as well. And uh, we, we see that flexibility as being quite important, especially in the early days when um, the entire uh, value chain as a fuel uh, is not fully uh, established. Right. So, wow. so just going back to my, am I right in saying that you're able to, you'll be storing it cold, but you'll be able to ex accept it warm and cool it down? Yes. Is that right? No, okay. Good. Thanks. <laughs> um, I've had a question about adoption of ammonia in the fishing fleet of Norway, and also a question about do you have any plans uh, for Indonesia in the future? So this is great. People are already starting to push you out of Norway. Uh, mm -hmm. You're expanding here. <laughs> yeah. What have you any plans for global domination here? Oh, uh, we we are. Uh early movers and uh, we, we are going to build uh, what we believe will be some of the first units uh, in, in the world and then we are very interested in going into the world and, and doing uh, similar projects so for the same for example building a ammonia bunkering terminal uh, for an Indonesian port or with an Indonesian partner that would be very interesting to us so so uh, get in touch if you have an interesting project there uh, when it comes to uh, Norwegian and Icelandic uh, fishing vessels, I think uh, there are some aspects of the fish fishing vessels that uh, make them uh, very uh, good early adopters and some that make them poor uh, early adopters. And um, let's say the, the good aspects is that um, 
for a fishing vessel, you don't really have a charter. The business of the fishing vessel is to sell fish, really, uh, or the, the fishing company that owns the, the fishing vessel. So then you can, you can, you, you don't have to, let's say, make the decision together with your uh, charter that you're going to pay a little bit extra for fuel. You make that decision yourself mm. and then you sell the fish with a carbon free uh, footprint uh, stamp on it. And maybe mm. you yourself can take a premium from that. So, mm. so that makes it very, very, uh, um, a very good segment to, uh, to decarbonize early. Um, mm. What is kind of making it difficult, especially for uh, factory ships and so on, is you, you don't have much uh, available space for this uh, increased fuel. And oftentimes you spend a long time at sea. So, so I, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I believe uh, six to eight weeks um, uh, be, between bunkering is quite uh, the, the normal is in, is yeah, yeah. in that segment. So, mm -hmm. so uh, that ma makes it more challenging. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but for sure it, um, it can be done. Uh, and there are some commercial aspects uh, in that business that makes it um, especially interesting, I think. Yeah, that's especially interesting. That's a that's the term we remember. So now we're coming close to time. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone again that we will have the next webinar in uh, in, uh, in in the, the second week of July. Uh, going to the USA. Hope you join us for that. Sorry, getting a plug in there again. Um, but just to just to round off, um, here's a, here's a statement for you, and maybe you could both give a quick reflection on that. So okay. it's. It's 2030, and um, among alternatives, ammonia fuel is seeing significant uptake in the maritime industry. What are the three main enablers that have uh, been developed to allow this? Carl Arthur. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, we need large expansion of renewable power, which we're already seeing, uh, because the future for ammonia as a fuel is, is not gray, but green or blue. Yeah, I should have said low uh, carbon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, uh, expansion of uh, of um, production uh, capacity uh, on on a large large scale uh, because we need the cost of it down uh, before you know with or without uh, CO two tax. Uh, I think we're going to see massive. You know, we're already seeing you know the standard vessel to to, to trade ammonia is today you know, on today is is a forty thousand cube. We're already seeing vessels, the VLGCs, coming out with uh, with ammonia capacity. That will be important. You know, in, in this transition, even though we're going green, we're not going to stop trading energy. You know, energy today is traded in, in coal, oil, and gas. Uh, in the future, we're going to trade energy in different uh, di di different manner. In terms of, we need to we need to move large scale hydrogen around the world, mm. and that means uh, trading that as ammonia. That's the most best. Uh, cost efficient way to do it on a large, large scale. Yeah. Uh, and we need to see uh, a good development on the, the various types of engines that we need, uh, both the two stroke and the four stroke. And as Andre said, you know, down the line, we might see, uh, see a fuel cell coming up at the right size with long, uh, long enough lifetime and at a cost efficient uh, price. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. And Andre, do you have anything to add to that? Just trying to squeeze us into our hour here, if we can. Well, uh, carbon tax. Carbon tax. Okay. Uh, no, uh, if uh, well, if we're going to see this uh, large scale shift, I'm uh, hundred percent certain that uh, there needs to be uh, some kind of uh, uh, system in place. Uh, in order to help us, uh, help industry uh, really use the capitalist uh, system to, to make the best uh, choices for this. Um, uh, the thing is that um, climate change has real financial costs. They are just not showing up on any uh, P&L uh, or a balance sheet yet because we don't uh, we haven't made the, the toolbox in the financial system for it uh, yet. Uh, but those are very, very real costs. And if they were being accounted for, then uh, uh, clean ammonia fuel would already be competitive. 
So, so it's not about not being competitive. It's about uh, really uh, the true costs yeah. not being accounted for. Mm -hmm. So, so once those costs are accounted for, then uh, gravity will uh, will work. Uh, it's possible to do um, uh, good things uh, before that. And that's what we are trying. We are looking at this uh, green transition of shipping as a 30 to 40 year uh, endeavor. And, and our approach uh, is uh, in the early days to, to find uh, segments and uh, specific niches that have um, a very early uh, adopter um, capability due to some specific uh, commercial factors. Uh, please, please, but but then yeah. in time, you need uh, you need to financially account for the costs of climate change. It, without that, uh, it's going to be uh, small uh, projects uh, such as the ones that we are working on now, and uh, we should be working on gigantic container and uh, bulker and, uh, and tankers. That's what's really going to move the needle. Yeah, I think that's that's a conversation that you don't hear very much about the accounting side of it. I do know there are some people heavily involved in trying to change the world in those terms. We're, we're drifting off particularly ammonia a little bit, but it's, uh, it's, it's very relevant and it's really nice to hear that. I think we're at time. We should probably wrap up. Uh, can people get in contact with you e easily? I think they can. I think we have uh, your, your information will be up on our side as well as yours. Um, I'm sorry to anyone who has had a question that isn't answered. You can always get back in touch with us uh, easily enough. Um, the recording will be available, as will be the presentations, and we can wrap up there. Thank you very much to everyone attending, and thank you very much to Amon. It's been fantastically interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much.